There it is. So I think we're going to do Q&A. I think at the end that makes more sense than splitting it up right here. So this is going to be twofold. I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to GSS, the Google Closure Style Sheets. And we're also going to introduce you how Julian integrated this into GoIt. So I don't need to introduce myself at this point anymore. If someone hasn't, doesn't know who Julian is, Julian um, is an open source contributor who works for ArcBees and has done a great job with the CSS3 stuff. And I'm going to talk about giving a quick introduction to GSS. I'm going to talk about the variables, the functions, the mix-ins, conditionals, linting, RTL flipping, and some more things in there. And then Julian is going to go into detail of how this is integrated. He's going to give you a timeline how this is going to move into GWT proper, so maybe GWT 3.0. And he's actually going to show you some cool demos of this working. So why GSS? Why is GSS a good thing? So in software development, we have this notion of dry, don't repeat yourself. And we're pretty good at this when it comes to Java source code. We're pretty good at this when it comes to HTML or something like that. But if you look at CSS, it basically looks like this. It's cluttered full of stuff, and that's because there are certain things missing to be able to perform dry spreadsheets. And if you look at this, variables are missing. So this means that you have to repeat the same string over and over in your CSS file instead of just defining a variable, let's say the background color, and just updating that value, it just propagates through your style sheet. Another thing that is missing from CSS to make it more dry is the ability to derive a value from one other value. Let's say you want to have a shadow. That shadow should a little bit, be a little bit darker than the original color of the element. There's no way to express that relationship in CSS, so you end up copying two different strings all over the place. And functions in GSS actually offer this kind of functionality. And also you end up copying the same things all over your style sheet in terms of classes and attributes in those classes. If you've ever defined, let's say, a linear, uh, let's say, a gradient, the linear gradient in your CSS, you're copying those fields all over the place instead of using macros. Where you could just say, well, this is how I want to do a gradient or a background, and I can just say, now do this background here. And the closure style sheets actually have all those things better than So they're not something completely new. So if you're already able to write CSS, you won't be looking at GSS and telling you, oh, something completely new to learn. That's a lot of work. We'll be using mostly CSS, but have some extensions on top of this. And the idea is here, you write GSS, and then you hit a compiler and it just outputs plain CSS for you. But doing so, it actually adds variables, conditionals, mixing, it has minification, it has linting, right to left support, it just flips your properties and it can rename stuff. But before I actually go into, let's say, before I bore you with uh, telling you about all that stuff, uh, it's supposed to work like that, just get really into some examples. So, this is how variables look in GSS. You can just say add def, background color, and put an arbitrary literal into this. And you can even do something like this here, like the third one, def, background color, and just use another variable to define it. So you can actually express that they're connected. And then you can just use that in different places. You can say body, the background color is now the variable background color. Or you could do something like dialog has the background color, dialog background. And you can even use it in compound statements, like one pixel solid dialog border color. So if, if you guys are concerned, I'm just going to make the slides available after that. So as soon as I hit a compiler, this actually transforms into this. So this is what you ha would have been writing <laughs> anyway in, uh, in CSS. So this is with clear variables. This is what you would have ended up doing in copy-paste. On top of that, GSS adds functions. <laughs> and there are several different arithmetic functions like add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, min, and max. And all those functions accept a variable amount of mm -hmm. arguments. So you could do something like add 2 pixel, 3 pixel, 4 pixel. Arguments um, can be purely numeric, so you could do add 1, 2, 3. But if they have CSS units, and they should have, they're only allowed to have the same um, CSS units. You could not do something like add one pixel 2%. That's not going to work. 
And of course, multiply and divide, they only accept a, a CSS unit value in the first parameter, so you cannot do something like um, 3 pixel times 4 pixel. It doesn't make sense. What's that? Pixel squared. It doesn't make sense. So it's not as flexible as um, some of you guys may know CSS calc, but it actually yields way more maintainable style sheets if you do it this way. So let me give you an example of how functions look like. So again, we're defining two variables here, and then we have a left-hand nav and we have content. And we want to position them like this. So uh, one of the left, the other one should go to the right. So we're both giving them a position absolute. And we're giving, to the left-hand nav, we're giving it width and a padding. But now you can see down here, the margin for the content has to be two times the padding of this element here, and it's width. So it actually ends up right sitting right next to it here. We can just express that relation right now in GSS. We can just say, well, I'm going to need the left-hand nav padding, then need the width and the padding again. So you actually can make sense of what's going on here in the style sheet. But as soon as you hit the compiler, it just, just moves to this here. So this is what you would have been writing normally, but you, this 186, you would have tried to guess that this is actually connected. There are many different functions inside of GSS, like blending colors, uh, changing colors slightly, making contrast, adjust brightness and stuff like that. We can just pass in a value and change it slightly. So let's say you want to have a shadow for a certain element, you can just derive that value very easily. There's one function that's called select from, and that's basically giving you an if statement. So you can do something like add def, my def, select from foo bar bus. So if foo is true, the value of my def is going to be ending up being bar, if it's false, it's going to end up being bass. So you can use this to nest different things and achieve different layouts of your statue, but just um, passing in different uh, variables to a compiler. But you can also supply your own functions. And that's what makes uh, GSS pretty valuable. So if there's a lot of function already built in, but if you decide I need this one function to make something really valuable to me, you can just implement a Java interface called GSS Function Map Provider, and you can just pass that interface <coughs> um, to the compile, and it just will call your Java code. You do anything in that Java code that you want to do. Closure also supports mixins, and mixins basically are a list of parameterized values. So you're going to have two things. You're going to have the declaration, and you're going to have the usage of that declaration. So before, I, this is not actually um, very hard to do. So this is how you define a mixin. You just say add def mixin. In this case, I'm naming the mixin size, and I'm giving it a width and a height that I'm assigning internally to the width and the height. And now you can see in the logo class, I'm just using that by saying add mixin size 150 pixels, 55 pixels. If I hit the compiler, it just compiles into this here, saying width 150, height 55 pixel. So this is actually not a good example of how to use a mixin. Let's, let me give you a practical example what a mixin can do for you. Let's say you're trying to define a background with linear gradients. If you take a look at mgrid, it uses a lot of this stuff. So we're going to define now a mixin called gradient. We're going to give it all the variables it needs. And we can just say, well, for, for all the browsers, we're just going to set the background color to a fallback color. Then we're going to start off by saying background image. Um, now we're going to do the WebKit permutation thing with a dash WebKit, pass in the values here. We can see we're deriving that with the <laughs> SS, uh, S, HSL function. And then we're actually going to put the at alternate thingy there to make sure we can have the next property with background image. We're going to do it for Mozilla. Then we're going to do it for sorry, and then we're going to do it for Oprah. And then, this is how it basically now looks in your, sp uh, in your uh, in the usage, just saying add mix and gradient with these values. Much, much nicer. And actually what the compiler outputs is just, just the stuff you would have written by hand. GSS also supports conditionals, so you can define a variable nested in different conditionals. I've actually taken this from the Google Closure widgets, those are the JavaScript widgets, and this is how they used to define a block inline element. So you can see if the browser was IE, or if it was IE6, we had to use inline. Let's say if it was Firefox 2, they had to use mods inline box. So now you can actually hit the compiler at command line and say, well, I'm compiling now for, for the browser Firefox 2. 
and then it would actually output where we need to use display mods inline box. And if you were just to call it without any variables, it would just be inline box. So, uh, defining different variables and then being able to define different permutations. We kind of have this notion already in GWT. Another thing that GSS can do for you is linting. So it can take a look at your CSS and tell you if you have errors in there. And it will actually fail the compile if you have errors. So let me ask you, where's the error? Yeah, please. Okay, there's one typo in there. That, that could happen to you. And it doesn't make sense to actually search for that typo. A full room of people, and you actually just spotted one error, or where's the other? RGBA. No, RGBA, that's, that's completely okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The border color is in there twice. So this is what the compiler would actually have outputted. It would have highlighted the URL here, and it would have said, well, the border color, that's like in there twice. Which one did you actually mean? If you, want, if you actually mean you want to have both in there, you can put an like, alternate in there to tell the compiler I'm fine with having two, but normally you wouldn't be fine with this. So GSS can also do right to left flipping for you. So if you're developing grid applications that you're sharing with some nationals that do right to left, which kind of looks for us like the wrong way of doing stuff, but yeah, it has to work for those people as well. Um, you can do something like this. You're defining a logo which has a margin left, and then you're defining the shortcut accelerator which has a border right and a padding and so on, but it has one attribute out there, the, the direction, that says no flip. So please don't flip this value. So if you go ahead and now compile this for people that are using right to left, it will end up looking like this. So look at the margin. The margin left just changed to margin right. So it used to be margin left, now it's margin right. So the compiler is smart enough to actually flip this. If you look at the shortcut accelerator, it used to be border right two pixel, now it's border left two pixel. If you look at the padding, it swapped the values here as well. It used to be zero two pixel, zero four pixel, now it's zero four pixel, zero two pixel. But because of the no flip attribute in the direction here, this is not swapped at all. This is how GSS gives you control about this. So this is practically all you have to know about GSS. This should get you started pretty easily. And I actually want to hand it over to Julian now, who did all the work of bringing that into Quid and telling you what he's actually done with his work. So please, Julian. Thanks, Zach. So <clears throat> it will be a little bit silly to show you, to present you a tool like Google Cruise your style sheet if you are not able to use it in your big project. So it's why I'm here today is to present you to you uh, a new project that I created on GitHub uh, that aims to integrate uh, Cruise your style sheet with Grid. Uh, the first question is maybe why? Um, as Daniel has just shown, uh, Cruise your style sheets uh, have a lot of awesome features that make it a powerful tool to write and maintain your CSS. And the second reason is that Cruise Style Sheet supports CSS3. And I think you don't disagree with me if I said that uh, Grid lacks in terms of CSS3 support. So for example, you cannot use CSS3 selector. You, you have to, um, you cannot use a CSS3 animation and so on. So it was time to fix that. Um, so it's why, it's why we created a, a new resource that we called GSS resource. And I will show you in the next slide that the usage of this new resource is very similar to the CSS resource. So first, you have to define your GSS file. So GSS is a common extension when you work with a uh, close station. So it's a CSS file where we can use all the features that uh, Daniel uh, presented. Uh, and so there I'm defining two, two variables, I'm defining a mixing, and we can use also uh, CSS3. So for example, I'm using a um, start with attribute selector, uh, something that we cannot use now with a uh, with, uh, CSS resource. Uh, when it's done, it's as with CSS resource, we just have to 
uh, create an interface that would extend the GSS resource <laughs> interface. And this, inter this interface will contain uh, all the methods uh, uh, that allow you to access the, the class name that you define in your GSS uh, uh, file. Because after a compilation, the class name will be obfuscated, so you need a method to access uh, your class name. And you can also define the method to access to the variable that you defined previously in your GSS file. And the same with uh, that with the <coughs> CSS resource, you, after that you have to define a method in a client bundle where you specify where is the source to use to compile your GSS resource and this method will give you uh, uh, an instance uh, of your interface. No, how to use it, nothing new for you. We create the bundle with the grid create method. We call the, we get an instance of your resource. We call the answer injected method to be sure that the CSS is injected uh, into the DOM. And after we can access to uh, the, the, the name of your style classes, uh, thanks to the method to, to your interface. So it's nice. We, we just define uh, a new resource uh, that helps you to maintain your, your CSS in your application. And this resource is similar to the CSS resource, something that you are familiar with, so nothing new to, to learn. Except that now you can use uh, all CSS tree, and you can use the awesome feature that Daniel presented just before. <coughs> um, so, Cruzo style sheets are, are interesting feature, but CSS resource have also interesting feature that Cruzo style sheets doesn't have. So, for example, uh, in CSS resource, you can define a split image uh, from an image resource. You can uh, evaluate at runtime a static and Java static method. Or, for example, you can get the, proper, the value of a property of uh, another resource with the value function. This, we are pretty convinced that uh, we are convinced, in fact, that this feature uh, has to be implemented in the new GSS resource. So it's what we did. But unfortunately, the way that you, the way to define this feature in the new GSS resource is slightly different than with CSS resource. That means that <coughs> the GSS resource is not backward compatible with the CSS resource. In other words. You cannot take your existing CSS resource and just repa replace the extension by GSS resource. But you don't have to, to worry about that because I'm writing a tool that will convert your existing CSS file in a GSS file that will be compatible with GSS resource. So the transition will, be, will run smoothly. So how to define you know, the image sprite, the image sprite, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, it's sprite to sprite. Um, no, it's not an at rule anymore. You just have to define a property grid sprite, and you you just um, give the the name of the image resource. Uh, the <coughs> the runtime substitution before that we uh, in CSS resource we use a uh, uh, eval at rule. No, it's not an uh, at rule anymore. Uh, it's just an eval function. So you define the function, uh, you define um, a constant, and then you use the eval function to say, okay, my function will be equal to uh, the the result of the, the black method. It's a static method. And you give the path of, of your static method to evaluate. And now, as it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function, you can use the eval function everywhere uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your style sheet. <laughs> Value function exactly the same that uh, in uh, in CSS resource. We define the value. You you, you pass as, as argument uh, the value that you want to evaluate, and you can give a prefix or a suffix to it. Uh, how far it is down? Uh, for the moment, uh, we support all close of style sheet features. So all the, the features that uh, Daniel has presented, you can use it uh, in your CSS <coughs> file. Uh, we support some uh, CSS uh, resource features, so the image sprite, the runtime substitution, the value function, the RTL support, and so on. But 
the big missing thing from the timing is uh, the, the ability to define conditional CSS based on permutation axis. So for example, to define different CSS depending on the user agent and, and the local. But it's something that uh, I'm working on, so it should be implemented uh, as soon as possible. <coughs> the roadmap, so it's really to use. I will show you some example after uh, that use the, the GSS resource. It's available in the, in the G GitHub uh, repository <coughs> gss.grid. Uh, so it's available as a third party library, so you can uh, include in your project. Uh, you just be aware that uh, it's in development, so uh, things can change, and yeah, you can meet some issues. So we ask you to just please test and uh, re report issue on the GitHub uh, project if you if you meet some 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 bugs. Um, yeah, so the uh, the condi conditional uh, CSS as I told uh, one slide before, you can expect that uh, it's implemented in the Q1. Um, yeah. This bullet point is not uh, relevant anymore. Uh, no, we know how the transition with CSS uh, resource uh, looks like. And if, if everything goes smoothly, we can expect that uh, GSS resource will be shipped in grid 3.0. But you can uh, use it right now. So uh, it's time for demo. <coughs> So I will show you two, two demos. The first demo is uh, more to show you that uh, we have a full support of CSS3. So it's a CSS, CSS3 uh, 3D cube, in fact, the, done in CSS and HTML. So each face of the cube <laughs> is a div. And uh, we use the CSS3 transformation to make it a cube. And the, the automatic rotation, in fact, is done with the CSS3 animation. And okay, it's, you have the, the grid plot that allows you to, to rotate your side <coughs> of the, the cube. You can zoom in, zoom out. So it's pure, pure CSS. And, oops. And if I show you the, the code, just let me. So you can see here the definition of the automatic rotation. Um, and so on. So we, we use really all CSS2 features that, to make the, this, uh, this example. And, and this is the, <coughs> the GSS resource. So it's something that you are familiar with. And uh, <coughs> the second uh, demonstration, <coughs> let me zoom a little bit. Uh, this is the <coughs> a simple cell list. That is the cell list that is coming from the, the grid showcase. So it's a cell list you are in the infinite infinite scrolling panel. So when we reach the, the bottom of the scroll, we load the more item in the, 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 <coughs> the cell list. And note that we can use the CSS tree. We can make this cell list six years, more six years. So I, we just Show, um, to choose a scroll effect here. So when no, when I, I will scroll on the um, on the cell list, no, we just add CSS three effect to to more something like this. Or I think that's I think that's pretty cool actually. That's just it's as easy as adding a class there. And I yeah, think that's pretty added. slick. In fact, when I, I choose the when I change the effect, I just change the CSS tree, the, the the class on the on the side list. So we can turn a lot of and it's very let's say. So who thinks that's cool? And it's it says CSS tree, so it's very really performant. You know, you can scroll really quickly. So yeah, let's get back to slides then. So let me quickly sum this up. <coughs> so we've introduced you to a simple and maintainable way to write your CSS, and that's going to be closure style sheets. 
and there are many new exciting features in there. And uh, GSS is already used widely by lots and lots of Googlers. This new GSS resource that Julian has built um, is a very, very good example of how we can actually make major changes to GWT that help a lot of people and uh, make a big impact on the GWT ecosystem. So I really think um, this is an awesome contribution. I think it's mo most likely one of the biggest outside contributions we actually had to GWT for a very long time. So one hand for So this has been on our wish list for a really long time. This has been on my personal, personal wish list for a long time since I was writing MGWIT. Uh, I had to always escape the CSS just to make it run through that old flute parser, and Julian just solved that for me. So I'm going to be very happy in moving MGWIT pretty soon up to GSS resources. So this is absolutely usable. You've just seen the demos, and you can use it in your projects. Um, but we encourage you, this is new, and there might be subtle bugs. <coughs> so please, use it and report bugs. You can really help us to get this into Bit 3.0. And, um, and we want to open up for questions, but let me put one thing first. We need you guys to actually rate this session. I'm not going to tell you how to rate it, um, but <coughs> You should go up, pick up your mobile phone, go to uh, gwitcreate.com slash agenda and actually give us a vote. Five is the best one, one is the worst. Okay, so uh, please do this and we're happy to take questions. Yes, please. I'm really, I'm having really tough trouble seeing you because of the lights. I'm seeing one hand right there. Yeah. Can you use it in UI binder? Can you use it in UI binder? Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah, it, you, you can use it in UI Binder, but uh, you have to define the type. You, you have to define that the type is GSS resource. So wh when you use a UI style, you can define the type, and if you put uh, a GSS resource, it will work. But you can use it also by importing the, the, the resource directly with the UI with uh, tags. It works also. So, yeah. So, okay, right there. Does it support media queries? Ah, uh, yeah. Of course it supports media queries. GSS supports all CSS3 features. Uh, had someone else speaking up? Yeah, please. Ah, yes, please. Um, is it actually the best practice to create kind of multiple GSS files and compile them just to one CSS, or is it this be done? So you mean like you would, as a, we actually got a similar question in San Francisco. If you want to have like common defines or something like this, like common variables you're going to use in all over the places. Yes, what you can do is actually, um, there's this annotation that you put into the GSS resource where you're just listing up um, your CSS or GSS files. And uh, well, you can just uh, list up a couple of there. So you can have like my defines.gss, I don't know, and my actual styles. So you can have multiple. We actually do this in internally, we just spread them out as it makes sense. Um, let me quickly highlight, if you <coughs> want to stalk Julian and actually find more about this, you can do this on G+, or you can stalk him on Twitter. Um, you could do the same thing to me if you like. Um, yes, please, next. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so if you're using any more interesting CSS things like border, border radius, or background color, you need to have all these various prefix things so it works on multiple browsers. Has there any been an effort, ever been an effort to use a good compiler to like compile out the ones based on preferred bindings that aren't needed? So exactly. So the question was, um, you need to have all these prefixes with some advanced features. Isn't there like a way we could just define gradient and we actually do the work of splitting us? And we have definitely have discussed this. And we want to see if we can actually make this work for 3.0 and actually make the notion of um, permutations a little bit decoupled from the actual GWT compiler and treat the CSS more than like data that we just spit into your output. Um, yeah, we definitely want to do this, and we actually don't want you guys to write lots of different uh, make sense just to do this. Maybe we end up using um, the permutation axis together with some predefined make sense and just uh, chunking out the stuff you actually need. It seems like the other direction also be like a pretty increasing your output code. Yes, uh, that's actually significant. I'm going to go into detail about this in MGWIT, but let me give you one quick idea about this. So the MGWIT slider has around eight kilobytes of CSS with it for all the different platforms. If you're doing responsive design, you would actually end up shipping those kilobytes down to the device, so eight kilobytes. If you actually split it up, let's say, 
and only look at the permutation of the NI formats, it's only 734 bytes. So it's roughly more than a factor of 10 that you can win there. And if there's such a huge win, of course, we're going to look into making that automatic with the compiler. Yes, in the back, please. Uh, is there any specific support for SVG resources? Oh, I don't know. Do you know? No. So we, we probably, <laughs> we maybe have to look that up. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, please. My, my question is kind of you know, conceptual and may sound a little bit silly. Uh, I've been using client module and CSS resources for a while, and static code typing for CSS is a pretty thing. But what's the real purpose for it? Why not simply substituting the CSS files for any? I don't get the question. What is the value of CSS or GSS resources? Um, yes, what, what is the value of CSS resources? So what's their value? So let's say you have a CSS file that is fairly huge, which has like, I don't know, a thousand classes in there, but you're only using one class out of this whole file. So a normal person without the compiler has to download the complete uh, payload of this file, and then the browser has to parse all of that and actually just decide to pick up this one class. Because we can actually now, uh, because we actually have the CSS resource, we can see if which class, which method on the interface is actually called and strip out all the classes that are actually not needed. So this means if you have a huge amount of images defined there, and that's again, I can actually tell you this from MWID. So if you're only using one widget from MWID, you're only paying for this one widget with its CSS. You're not going to pay for all the others. And that's a huge advantage um, that the GWT compiler brings with it in this dead code stripping that it's very hard to do in other ways. Sorry, the question was good. Thank you. No, not sorry. It was a good question. Thanks. Any more questions? Oh, zero minutes left. So, um, I'm sorry. If, if you guys have more questions, just approach me or Julian. Um, we, we would like to help you with this. Sure.